getting ready to jump into the last portion of the book of Deuteronomy. Um, excited to see that uh, we might be finishing this tonight, Lord willing. Uh, you can be turning in your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 33. Uh, as you know, Deuteronomy is uh, written by Moses. It's his second telling of the law. Moses, is, one of his nicknames is the lawgiver. And we met him in Exodus where God called him up onto Mount Sinai and gave him the Ten Commandments and the law. And he led the children of Israel through the wilderness for 40 years and taught them the judgments, the statutes, the precepts, the commandments of God. And uh, now we come to the end of that telling of the law. Moses, the author, or at least the compiler, recorder of Genesis chapter, or Genesis, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. <coughs> he wrote five books in the Bible, and uh, here we're going to come to the, pretty close to the end of his writings tonight. We'll see how this comes together. We, uh, last time we were together, went through chapters 31 and 32, and these last four chapters kind of summarize all of Moses' ministry to the Israelites. In chapter 31, we saw a new leader where Moses appointed Joshua to take his place. In chapter 32, we saw a new song where Moses, who was quite the songster, wrote a song, and, and we enjoyed that last time we were together. Chapter 33, we're going to get a new blessing, and in chapter 34, a new home. And so even though we're coming to the end of the road, all things are new. Kind of a fun way to finish at the beginning. Chapter 33, verse 1. Now this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. I'm going to stop there, and what we're going to see is Moses now blessing each of the tribes, much as Jacob, Israel, did for each of his sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. Moses recorded that for us in Genesis chapter 49. And I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if, as the Holy Spirit was guiding Moses in this blessing to the tribes of Israel, much of it followed after what Jacob said back in Genesis. But there are definite differences. For starters, this is Moses. It's not Jacob. Different time, different place, a lot of water under the bridge, if you will. And as we've seen God work through Jacob, renamed Israel, and his tribes, We've watched Israel now all these many years through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, be constituted as a nation, a, a, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, God's own peculiar people with a purpose and an agenda that God has chosen for them. And Moses, that leader who God tapped to lead them through the wilderness. It says here, and it's interesting, this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel. Now, to be certain, Moses wrote this. So when Moses says, the man of God, that's, that's what the Holy Spirit guided him to write, speaking of himself. This is the first usage of that term, man of God, in the scriptures. And it's used quite sparingly throughout the scriptures. It's not a title that very many people get. And part of that is because we know Moses was a, 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 a man of God. He was a friend of God. He was intimate with God. And he had a unique, very, very special relationship with God. But I think one of the things, as we read it here in verse 1 of chapter 33, is we just finished reading a couple verses just prior to this, God telling Moses, okay, end of the road. They're going across the river, 
You're going up on that mountain, and I'm going to bury you. The end. And what does Moses do? You can imagine how melancholy this must be. The, the struggle uh, being raised in Pharaoh's court and then trying to stand up for his own people only to have it backfire and he has to flee into the wilderness for 40 years only to find himself now tapped to go back to Pharaoh and deliver these people, this stiff-necked, stubborn people who are always going astray for 40 years trying to shepherd them. We're going to the promised land. We're going to the... Come on, you guys. Let's, let's go. And now they're there, but not Mo. You don't go, Mo. We know because Moses misrepresented God when the people were thirsty and God told Moses, speak to the rock. That rock which originally you struck and water came out, we read in 1 Corinthians 10, that rock, that water that followed these people through the wilderness was Jesus. And Jesus only needed to be struck once for the sins of the world. Now if you need water, you need living water, you need his Holy Spirit, you speak to him. You don't crucify him over and over again. But Moses and his brother Aaron misrepresented God and that God says for that, you don't go into the promised land. Now, to be certain, going into the promised land is very much a picture of a Christian's walk as we come to God through the law. Moses is the lawgiver. And the law, with, with it we can see right and wrong, good and evil, what God would have us do. Without the law, we'd never know what God's will for our life would be. But with the law, we clearly see we fail. And it's that law that brings us right to the precipice, right to the edge, where then we need to confess our sins, accept Jesus' forgiveness of sin, uh, our sins, his debt paid for us, and then we can, in the power of the Holy Spirit, enter into that new walk, that new life in Christ. That's what that going into the promised land is a picture of. Not going to heaven but on earth, walking in the presence of God, in the power of God, in the Spirit of God. The law can't get you there. The law can bring you up to the edge, but it can't take you in. And so there's a lot of uh, word pictures, if you will, in the life of Moses and what's happening here. But you can imagine, now that he's here, and God says, go up onto um, the mountain, and look out Mount Nebo and, and look at where you could have gone, should have gone, didn't go, Mo. Well, how he would feel so bittersweet. He'd be tough. Think of something maybe that you've ever done. Somebody asked you to do it. You didn't really choose to do it. You were kind of maybe coerced into it. But nevertheless, you, you agreed, and you put your shoulder to the plow. You gave it your effort. You put your best foot forward. And through all kinds of toils and snares, everything went together. It came together. But at the end of the day, you get thrown under the bus for being a whiner and a complainer and a grumbler. You weren't a really good leader. And you think, why did I even sign up for this job? I didn't even want it. You can imagine how Moses is kind of feeling. Why didn't you just leave me out on the backside of the desert? And yet, I believe, and we're supposed to be in chapter 33. Here I am going back to chapter 32. Yeah. <laughs> I believe that's part of why Moses can write, honestly, a man of... God. Look what it says. Now this is the blessing which Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. Now this is a beautiful picture of the heart of Moses. Why God chose him. 
to be the leader, to be the shepherd, to be the pastor of these people. Because Moses blessed them. Even in his moment of probably greatest, <laughs> I don't know what the right word is, but here I'm about to die. I don't go in the promised land. I see it all there. Oh, man, all those people, they're going and I'm not going. Oh, man, what should I do? I know, I'll bless them. That's what came to your mind, right? But that's what Moses did. A man of God. It's going to be interesting before we end in these two chapters. Moses will be called a servant of God. I think they're wonderful bookends to these two chapters. A man of God, a servant of God. And in the middle we see the heart of that man of God, that servant of God. So he blesses, much as Israel blessed, or Jacob blessed the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, you could reference Genesis 49 and get some stuff, but I'll, I'll go rather quickly through here. Um, but I'll try to highlight a couple things as we go. Uh, verse 2, and he said, the Lord came from Mount Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of his saints, his holy ones, from his right hand, came a fiery law for them. Yes, he loves the people. All his saints are in your hand. They sit down at your feet. Everyone receives your words. Moses commanded a law for us, a heritage of the congregation of Jacob. And he was king in Jeshurun. When the leaders of the people were gathered, all the tribes were gathered, all the tribes of Israel together. First thing he does in blessing them is make sure that they know who their God is and what God has done for them. That they are his own chosen people. He came from Mount Sinai. We know that on the Sinai Peninsula from Seir. That's the area of Eden and Mount Paran uh, uh, across the Jordan. He came with ten thousands of his saints. He came with, with the holy ones. From his right hand came a fiery law for them. I love this fiery law. It's a shining law. It's a brilliant law. You can imagine back in the day, long before neon lights, this is that law, just a, a, a beacon to the children of Israel. This is the way. This is the path. Get on the path. It brings you to me. Beautiful law that the children of Israel have. This is Moses' blessing for them. You've got God. You've got the way. You've got the truth. You've got the life. He's laid it out for you. A fiery law. In verse 3, yes, he loves the people. How many times we think the law is some kind of a burden, some kind of a buzzkill, you know, some kind of a joy robber. That's absolutely 180 degrees from what the law is for. Anybody who's ever raised kids gets this. You, you give your children rules because then it makes you feel big and tough like the boss. No, that's not why you do it. You give them rules so that they are safe and so that they prosper and flourish. That's why you set the boundaries to get them going in the right direction because you love them. Yes, he loves the people. All his saints are in your hand. They sit down at your feet. Everyone receives your words. Moses, and this is interesting, he's, he's writing, but he's speaking in the third person. And it's so interesting, as the Holy Spirit is moving on him to write these things, he's stepping out of himself. This isn't about me. I'm going to bless the people. Why? Well, that's who I am. I'm not Moses. I am a man of God. God owns me. I do what God asks me to do. So he's not operating in the flesh. 
And in the third person, he can say, Moses commanded a law for us. It wasn't, it wasn't Moses' law. He didn't make it up. He commanded, or he charged. He gave them responsibility for it. A heritage of the congregation of Jacob. I love this, a heritage. We look in uh, different passages in the New Testament and how we look at Israel, uh, God's chosen people, special in privilege, especially in Romans chapter 9, and it opens up with all the blessings that God gave to Israel. The prophets, the law, the, the priesthood, the sacrifices, the promises. God gave all those things to Israel. They're so blessed, what a heritage God gave them. A heritage of the congregation of Israel. He was king in Jeshua. <laughs> Jeshua literally means a holy nation, an upright people, a holy nation. He was king. When the leaders of the people were gathered, all the tribes of Israel together. One king. We know him as King Jesus. But the people came together and recognized Yahweh God. That's our king. Now he goes and he's going to start blessing each of the 12 tribes by name with some kind of a blessing. And just before we start, I want to note there is one tribe lacking from the list. Um... I was going to tease you and see if you could figure it out before the end, but better if I just tell you so I don't forget. We'll get to the end, and, and you'll never know which one because I'll forget to tell you. Simeon is not mentioned in the list. In Genesis 49, uh, Simeon and Levi, in their blessing in 49.5, it says, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. It goes on to say all the different things that they did in their anger. And God says to them, I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. And so, as we go through here, you're not going to see Levi mentioned or have a blessing. The bless, I mean, Simeon mentioned. The only blessings that Simeon will pick up here will be whatever blessings that he receives from being amongst his brothers. We'll see in Joshua as they come into the promised land and they start dividing up the land to each tribe's portion, Simeon is actually going to get scattered throughout Judah. They won't have like their one boundary or borderline, so just get a little piece over here, a little piece over there, they won't be consolidated. They'll just get kind of the crumbs, if you will, due to their behavior. Much like Moses doesn't go into the promised land, Simeon and Levi, for their wickedness, are not going to receive an inheritance. We'll, we'll talk about Levi in just one minute. But first, Reuben, who was the firstborn. Let Reuben live and not die, and let his men, let his men, let not, or nor let his men be few. One little, one little verse. Uh, not really much of a blessing, although you can say it's better than nothing. In that, let him live and not die. I'll take that. In fact, sometimes as a Christian, I'm like, what do I deserve? What kind of blessing is it you think God owes me? Man, Amen. nothing. <laughs> and yet I live. <laughs> because of what Jesus did for me. So that's quite a blessing, but really it's kind of not that powerful. Let Reuben live and not die, nor let his men be few, few in number, and or let his men be numbered. And it's interesting as you go from when they entered the promised land and they did the census in the book of Numbers, that's why it's called Numbers, because of the census. The first number uh, was 46,500, the second census at the end of the book of uh, Numbers for the tribe of Reuben was 43,730. So they were decreasing in size, in population, okay? And Reuben, because of his poor behavior with his father Jacob, lost leadership. He was the firstborn, but he abdicated the role, if you will. He, he forfeit it. And so 
He gets a blessing, but it's rather mild here. And then it goes on to verse 7. And he said, and this he said of Judah. Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah, and bring him to his people. Let his hands be sufficient for him, and may you be a help against his enemies. Now, this is nowhere near as big a blessing as Jacob gave to Judah back in Genesis 49. And we, we can see back in Genesis 49 that Judah has given so many blessings. He's even given the blessing that Messiah will come from you. The scepter shall not depart from Shiloh till uh, Messiah comes. Uh, and so we know Judah, the lion of Judah, the tribe of Judah, is the, the tribe that Jesus, Messiah, comes from. Quite a blessing. But in this one, it's not quite as big, but it is rather interesting. Hear, Lord, hear the voice Hear voice of Judah. Do you know what Judah means literally in Hebrew? Praise. praise. Oh. Hear the voice of praise, the tribe of praise. And you might remember as we were going through the book of Numbers and they were organized as they would travel across the wilderness, the first tribe of the 12 tribes, when they would set out after the Shekinah glory of God, would be Judah. They would lead and they would go forth in singing. And this is the strategy, the battle formation that we see frequently throughout the Old Testament, is they would put the choir up front as they would go into war. And here, the blessing is that the Lord would hear the voice of praise and bring him to his people, let his hands be sufficient for him, and may you be a help against his enemies. You're thinking about that, right? It's like the little drummer boy, or you got a, a, a fife, a flute, or something, and you're up there, and there's the enemy, and they're bristling with armaments, and bullets are flying, and you're just bum 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 And you're like, Lord, preserve me. And that's kind of what this blessing is about. Um, verse eight, and, Le and of Levi he said, now remember, it was Simeon and Levi, that were scattered. Levi never ever got an inheritance when they went into the promised land. They didn't get an allotment of land. They rather served the Lord. They served the Lord through the priesthood and through the Levites in the tabernacle and administering the um, sacrifices for the people. Their portion was the Lord. What the people would donate to the temple or through the sacrifices, they would live off of that. Let your Thuman and your Urim be with your Holy One. Now, Ur, the Thuman and Urim, we read about in Exodus, and the high priest upon his robe, there was an ephod, it was covered with stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and within that was a pouch where they kept the Urim and the, the, I mean the Thuman and the Urim. Now, to be clear, nobody really knows what these are, okay? But we see that sometimes people would come to the priest, they would have a problem. And if it was a difficult one and they didn't know the problem, they would take these two things and cast them in their lap. And then depending on what they were to discern from the way they fell or positioned themselves, we don't know, it's speculation. Then they would say, go left, go right, go to war, stay home, whatever the whatever the problem would be. Nobody knows for sure. Uh, the words mean perfection and lights. And so whatever it was, they were something that the Levites were able to use to lead and to guide the people of Israel in the way of perfection and in the way of light but it's a little bit uh, obscure exactly what that was. Um, it is interesting that Jesus is the light of the world. Mm -hmm. And in him, all comes clear. If we'll just follow after him. But it, it says here, let your thummim and your urm, your perfections and lights, be with your holy one. Make sure this is the, pre the, the they don't have a piece of property, but they are going to be your leaders. We need them to know the way to go. 
whom you tested at Massa, and with whom you contended at the waters of Mirabah, who says of his father and mother, I have not seen them, nor did he acknowledge his brothers, or know his own children, for they have observed, they have observed your word, and kept your covenant. They shall teach Jacob your judgments, and Israel their your law. So, one of the things that they did do well was when Moses came down off the mountain, when he was up getting the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, and the people were playing the harlot with the golden calf, it was the Levites who went through Israel and slaughtered 23,000 or something people uh, who were worshiping after this false god and ground it to dust and made the people drink the water, okay? And, or mixed it with water and made them drink it, okay? So it's the Levites that did that. So they did well, uh, not acknowledging fathers or brothers, but made sure they observed the word, okay? Uh, and then your job is now to teach the covenants of Jacob. Teach this law. This is what you're going to do. You're going to tell everybody this word over and over and over forever. That is your role. Then you shall teach Jacob your judgments and Israel law. They shall put incense before you and a whole burnt sacrifice on your altar. They were responsible for receiving all of this, the offerings. Now, they, they lived off of them. They were fed off of them. They got a portion off of some of them. But their job, fundamentally, if you think about what they would do, was they were butchers. And they would butcher animals from sun up to sun down. It was a bloody business and it was full of death and bleeding and whining and you know animal it was it was a really hard job but that's what they got they at least got a portion and their portion was the Lord and then allowing people through the sacrifice system through the blood shed on the altar to have their sins covered so they stood in the place of the people that they could come to God and get clean. It says, verse 11, Bless his substance, Lord, and accept the work of his hands. Make sure he doesn't go hungry. Strike the loins of those who rise against him and of those who hate him, that they not rise again. Anybody comes up against the Levites, let him be childless. Strike their loins. Don't let them have kids. Okay? Of Benjamin, he said, the beloved of the Lord, who shall dwell in the safety by him, who shelters him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. I love this. The beloved of the Lord. And we know that it's in Bethlehem that Jesus was born. And it's got a special place in God's heart. It's one of the things that's very, very interesting here to students of the Bible. This, this phrase, and he, which is speaking of the Lord, and the Lord shall dwell between his shoulders. This is just a really interesting uh, topographical, uh, geographical, interesting thing about the area where Benjamin was given his allotment. The way that the ridges in Bethlehem work, there were two ridges that would go up. I mean, they're flat on the ground, but if you looked at them from above, they would look to go up and then together. And it's right here in this bowl where they go together. It's called the shoulders of Benjamin in Israel. They call this geographic formation the shoulders of Benjamin. And it's at this place where these two shoulders of these ridges come together that Jerusalem is. And here we see one of the first foreshadowings of God saying, this is where the Lord will dwell, in Jerusalem, between the shoulders of Benjamin. So Benjamin's going to get a very special blessing, and that it will be there in Jerusalem that God chooses to make his name abide forever. What a blessing. Verse 13, and Joseph, he said, Blessed of the Lord is his land with precious things of heaven and with the dew and the deep lying beneath, with the precious fruits of the sun, with the precious produce of the mouse, with the best things of the ancient mountains, with precious things of the everlasting hills, with precious things of the earth and its fullness, and of the favor of him who dwelt in the bush. Let the blessing come on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. 
he was again separated, right? And sent off to Egypt, as sold as a slave. But rose up into a position where he was able to then bless his brothers and save his father and brothers and, and, and allow them to come forward into history. And uh, so there's a special blessing. While well, Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And we see in Je Genesis chapter 48, right before Genesis chapter 49, surprise, surprise, where God blesses the 12 tribes of Israel, God puts a, uh, Jacob puts a special blessing on Joseph's sons. He says, Joseph, bring your sons in here. And Joseph brings in Ephraim and Manasseh, firstborn, secondborn, lines them up to get the blessing. And then Jacob says he's old and doesn't have good sight, crosses his hands, and he puts the greatest blessing on the younger one. And, Mo and uh, Joseph says, oh, you got that backward. And he goes, no, I don't have it backward. And he blessed these two. But these two sons now receive the double portion that would have gone to Reuben, the firstborn. But because of Joseph and the crown of Israel, what he's done for all the 12 tribes, Joseph gets a bigger blessing in that both Ephraim and Manasseh get these blessings. In Genesis 49, speaking of... Uh, I'm sorry, I'll find it here. Joseph, in verse 22 of Genesis 49, Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over the wall, and uh, it just talks about all of his prosperity. And here we see all these pictures. Blesses the Lord in his land with precious things of the heaven and the dew. And it just goes down with this fruitful bough. And then we have Ephraim, the largest in population, of the tribes and Manasseh also large with a very large inheritance half on the east side of the Jordan half on the west side of the Jordan so sure enough Ephraim and Manasseh receive wonderful wonderful blessings it says in verse 17 like the like his glory is like a firstborn bull and his horns like the horns of a wild ox together with them he shall push the peoples to the ends of the earth they are ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. And Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in your going out, and Issachar, in your tents. And so Zebulun and Issachar get doubled in on this blessing. They shall call the peoples to the mountains. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall partake of the abundance of the seas and of the treasures hidden in the sand. This one is really very interesting. Their apportionment, their allotment, when they come into the promised land, will be in northern Israel, especially in the area of the Valley of Jezreel, which crosses from the Mediterranean Sea over to the north of the Sea of Galilee. And what's so interesting about this area of Zebulun and Issachar, it says down here they're going to partake of the abundance of the seas, and Haifa, one of the biggest ports in Israel today, is in this region of uh, Zebulun. But not only that, and it says, uh, partake of the abundance of the seas. And that word for partake is the word for, is the word suck. Like you would suck through a straw. Okay? That's what they're going to do. They're going to suck up all the blessings. Now, here's what's really interesting when you get down to it. It was back in the last century, early last century, that a guy reading his Bible realized that the Bible said there were tar pits in Babylon where Nebuchadnezzar built his great uh, kingdom. And he would figure... If there's tar pits, there's oil. And this guy, Bible scholar, you could say, name was J.D. Rockefeller, <laughs> formed Standard Oil Company and tapped the first oil wells in Iraq, Iran, and brought a pipeline through the valley of Jezreel to the port of Haifa. 
the first oil pipeline in the world. <coughs> and we know J.D. Rockefeller, at least my generation, he would be the Elon Musk of today. The uber billionaire. The Rockefeller families are just famous, but Standard Oil, it came from reading his Bible. Anyways, so they partook, they sucked the abundance of the sea and the treasures hidden in the sands. And isn't the Bible cool? I just, this stuff makes me just giggle. Okay. Verse 20, and of Gad, he said, Blessed is he who enlarges Gad. He dwells as a lion and tears the arm and the crown of his head. He provided the first part for himself because a lawgiver's portion was reserved there. He came with the heads of the people. He administered the justice of the Lord and his judgments with Israel. Wonderful blessings for Gad. Gad, again, was one of the tribes uh, with Manasseh that said, we want to stay here on the east side of the Jordan River in the area of Moab. There's wonderful land for our cattle. And so they got the first part for themselves, the East Jordan. Wonderful, wonderful, good grazing land. Um, it says, blesses is he who enlarged Gad. He dwells as a lion and tears the arm. And the, the people of Gad were known for their fierceness in battle. In 1 Chronicles 12, 8 and other places, it talks about how they were always supplying mighty warriors for King David's army. They were just always ready to go to battle and stick up for their brothers and, and go to battle. And remember, when they come into the promised land, here they are on the promised land. And part of the deal is you have to cross with us into the promised land and finish the battles. Then you can go home to your portion on the other side of the river. But you need to finish it. And they did. They were men of their word. They were men of battle. And they were men of the law and righteousness. It says, uh, because the law givers, giver's portion was reserved there. He came with the heads of the people. He administered the justice of the Lord and his judgments with Israel. They took care of business. They tackled the difficult things. And they always did the right thing. And therefore, they received this best portion. Okay? But they earned it. And this is the blessing that Moses gives to the tribe of Gad. Of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp, he shall leap from Bashan. Now, a little bit different, we know that Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah, that was their emblem on their, um, their flag as they would go into battle, was a lion. And so we think of lions as fierce and noble creatures. But here, Dan is a lion's whelp, or immature. And it says he shall leap from Bashan. Now, Bashan is an area on the north end of Israel, and yet Dan was allotted a portion in the south. And as you read through, uh, say, the book of Judges, you'll find that Dan uh, didn't like their portion in the south. It was too hard. It was in the hills. It was rocky. It's hard to pasture here. We can't farm. And so they decided to move, even though they were told, this is your mm -hmm part of the promised land in perpetuity, forever, it's yours. They said, nah, we're going to go somewhere else. And then you read in the book of Judges how they went up north. And they actually attacked people, peaceful people, living just tranquil, domestic, agricultural lives. They looked at the abundance and they said, oh, we can easily take them. And they did. And they relocated to the northern tribe, or to the northern part of Israel, the Golan Heights. But a lion's whelp, they're immature, not smart. And as you read again, say in the book of Judges and then throughout, this is where they fell into idolatry. And Jeroboam set up one of his two golden calves up there near Caesarea Philippi. I've been to the altar of Dan where they had the golden calf. And because they were there, they were the first to be attacked and go into captivity when Assyria took them away. There was nothing to protect them. So, lion's whelp, he shall leap from the shan, but not good. <laughs> uh, they're going to be attacked and moved out. 
And Naphtali, to Naphtali he said, O oh, Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full of blessing of the Lord, possesses the west and the south, okay, in the Galilee region. And they'll just be content. And uh, it says also in, in the, um, Genesis 49 that they'll, they'll be the one who brings delicacies or treats or, or goodness or blessing or sweetness to Israel. What a nice thing. You know, of all the different inheritance, right? So here you are, and you're, you're at the final will and testament of Papa Moses, and you're going to get your inheritance, and you wonder, what am I going to get? What am I going to get? I wonder what, man, Moses, I wonder what I'm going to get. And what, is, what does Naphtali get? Satisfied. With favor. How would you like it if that's what they read in your will and testament when you go? Many of us are looking for something different, but really, that's a wonderful, wonderful blessing. Satisfied with favor and full of the blessing of the Lord. Who could want more? And of Asher, he said, Asher is most blessed of sons. Um, let him be favored by his brothers and let him dip his foot in oil. Your sandals shall be iron and bronze in your days shall, and, and your day, as your days, so shall your strength be. And, it, and the land of Asher happened to be very mineral resource rich. Oil, iron, bronze. They got a pretty good deal out of the thing. Okay? Um, at any rate, that's the 12 tribes. You don't see Simeon in the list, but you do see 12 because Joseph gets Ephraim and Manasseh. Okay? And then now there's a summary of this blessing. Verse 26, there is no one like the God of Jeshurun, or the upright ones, the holy nation. There is no one like the God of the holy nation, who rides in the heavens to help you. And in his excellency on the clouds, the eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will say, destroy. Man, that's nice. My daddy's bigger than your daddy. <laughs> right? This is, this is the God of the upright ones. Verse 28. Then Israel shall dwell in safety, the fountain of Jacob alone, in a land of grain and new wine. His heavens shall also drop dew. Happy are you, O Israel. There it is. The promised land. Blessings await you. The, the rain and the riches and the protection and the peace. And man, it's all right there for you. Happy are you, O Israel. Who is like you? A people saved by the Lord. The shield of your health, the sword of your majesty, your enemy shall admit, uh, submit to you, and you shall tread down their high places. Yahoo. These are probably right here, the last words written by Moses. As we finish out in chapter 34, we're going to see it's kind of like an obituary, probably written by Joshua. You'll see why Moses probably couldn't have written it. Although, I have heard commentators, and commentators that I really respect, and it intrigues me, that maybe the Holy Spirit helped Moses write his obituary. Could be. Think of all the things that God has revealed to us through Moses. Wouldn't it be something if God told you, this is what it's going to be like, Daryl. We're going to go up on the mountain together, and you're going to look around, you're going to see everything, and then you're going to lay down and die. And I'm going to bury you. And I want you to write that down so everybody knows what happened to you. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, you know? God could do that. Yeah. But a lot of people, most people would say, this might be where those words end. One last thing before we jump in. It says, happy are you, O Israel, who, who is like you? Who's like Israel? Is anybody like Israel? Is there anything equal to Israel? Well, two things that I, I, I think in all of this, 
that who is like you is the name of the angel, the archangel, that God assigned to Israel to protect Israel specifically. We read in the book of Daniel how when Daniel was praying for Israel, Michael, the archangel, was delayed in coming and then finally got there. Michael is Israel's guardian angel. Michael's name means who is like God. And in every circumstance where God would take them and Michael would go to bat for them or, or God would, would work for them, every time it would say there's nobody like Yahweh God. Yahweh God. He alone is God. Chapter 34. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, the top of Pisgah. That's a series of ridges that form this range of mountains, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan. And you're going to read a list here. And, and if you were imagining, you're standing on Mount Nebo, and down before you, is the Rift Valley. It runs from the Middle East all the way down into Tanzania, Africa. Big, big rift in the surface of the earth. But the, in this valley, at the bottom of the valley, is the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. Across the river and the Dead Sea, you can see the City of Palms, Jericho, 800 feet below sea level. And then you see the ascent up the Judean backbone of hills that runs north to south. And at the top of the mountain, Moses wouldn't have seen this, but you could see it if you go there today, is Jerusalem. And then beyond the hills, the Mediterranean Sea on the back side of that range of mountains looking off to the west. And here we see the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan. It's interesting here, and maybe this is why it's rewritten. This is all the way to the north. And this list kind of goes, let's see if I can get my hand. I want to go this way, so I want to go this way. Okay, so it's like a hand on a clock going from north, and here's Moses counterclockwise to the south. Okay, so he's looking out across the promised land from Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, working your way down from the north, all the land of Judah, that's over towards where Israel, or Jerusalem is, towards the western sea, that's the Mediterranean, and the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. That's going on down to the Gulf of Aqaba and the Red Sea. So going all the way down that way. It must have been a beautiful, clear day. You can see forever. It's a, it would be a fantastic uh, site. I've never been there personally, but um, I've, you know, Googled it. <laughs> Verse 4. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. But you saw it, but you shall not cross over there. So the so Moses the servant of the Lord died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his grave to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. diminished. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses ended. Standard mourning in those days for a person would be seven, but Moses was quite the guy, right? Uh, love him or hate him, and Israel did both. When it came time to honor him, they had a 30-day memorial for him of weeping and mourning uh, and going forward. So the, kind of a neat thing in all of that. I'm going to back up and kind of touch on a couple of these things that I didn't touch on as we were going through this. Um, interesting, 120 years. 
And you can break Moses' life up into three basic chunks as you go through. Forty years in Egypt. He was 40 when he killed the uh, Egyptian who was hassling the Israelites, and then he ran away. He spent 40 years in the desert of Midian, tending Jethro's herds. That's when he came across Moses at the burning bush. Not Moses, a God at the burning bush. And was commissioned to go take the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land, another 40 years. So it's a really nice way to break up his life in three pieces. Um, but here he is, 120, but his vigor and vim is not diminished. He's as strong as he ever was, fit as a fiddle. But he's done. That's as far as you go, Mo. Can't get any farther, right? And to some degree, it's a picture of the law. And the law is powerful and strong and unrelenting. But it can't deliver you to the promised land. It can take you to the border, but then you, have, you need to die to yourself and then allow Jesus to fill you with his Holy Spirit and walk with you as you go conquering on your way to heaven. Okay? Unlike that song, beautiful hymn, Swing low, sweet chariot, come, come and carry, carry me home. Okay? But in that song, it, 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 it makes the promised land look like you're going to heaven. That's not what the promised land is. And the Bible never depicts the promised land as, a, as heaven. It's really more a picture of us going forward in battle in the name of the Lord, in the power of the Lord, in the spirit of the Lord. We'll get to that next week in the book of Joshua. But uh, here, they're going on in to the promised land. And, and I like it here. So Moses, the servant of the Lord. Remember, we started this chapter with the man of God. And now here we are at the end of his life. And what did God say about him? What are the final words to describe this man? If, if you and I, you know, if you were to be buried and have a tombstone, often you read the epitaph on the tombstone, here lies a husband, a father, or whatever, whatever. Everybody writes different things. You don't get to write it. Other people write it for you. And sometimes you read some of these epitaphs, you're wondering, I would have never wrote that about myself, good or bad. But they get the last word. And here God gets the last word. And what does he say? What did he write for that line? on the tombstone, if you will. Moses didn't get a tombstone. Nobody even knows where he was buried, right? But uh, does it say, what does it say? It, it's not Moses, prince of Egypt. It's not Moses, murderer of an Egyptian. It's not Moses, shepherd in the wilderness. It's not Moses, spokesman of the nation. It's not Moses, miracle worker. It's not Moses, prophet. It's not Moses, the man who saw a piece of God's glory. It's not Moses who never entered the promised land. What does it say? A servant, a servant of the Lord. What a, an amazing thing. What does Jesus tell us when all is said and done? That we would hear these words. Well done. Good and faithful servant. And yet... I think there's no higher calling than to be a servant. Jesus would tell his apostles over and over, and they needed to hear it a lot, if you would be first, you must be servant of all. It's how it works in the kingdom. Jesus did not come to serve, but to save. And while aspiring to be a servant is a wonderful thing, and I believe every Christian is called to servanthood. You can kind of almost check yourself and see, how well am I doing with my little servanthood role? One of the best ways to tell how well you're doing is not by the number of ministries that you head up or the number of hours you put in 
or the number of things that you sacrifice, I think one of the best ways to measure your servanthood is to watch how you respond when people treat you like a servant. We chafe at that. Don't you know who I am? And yet, God gets the last word. Moses, a servant of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite of Beth Peor, but no one knows his grave to this day. At least no mortal. Now, it's possible that Michael, who I just mentioned, the archangel, might have some sense of where that was. In the book of Jude, there's this obscure verse where Jude is making an argument against the apostate uh, false prophets and false leaders. And so he's, he's really jamming up these people who claim to be the office of the servant. They act like they're lord and boss of everybody. Um, he says in verse 8 of Jude, Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. And then, as an illustration to support that, he uses, he says, yet Michael, verse 9 of Jude, yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Even Michael, the archangel, the powerful angel, didn't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan. He didn't bring a reviling accusation. Now, Jude is trying to make a case here that if you're truly a Christian, you're not going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with other Christians or other people. You're not going to act like Lord and, and Lord it over others. And that's what he's trying to make a case. Even Michael the archangel didn't do that with Satan. He simply said, the Lord rebuke you. That's all you have to do. Let the Lord fight your battle for you. Yet in it, he says, it happened that he just said, the Lord rebuke you. He didn't, uh, he didn't uh, revile Satan while they were arguing over the body of Moses. And that has brought hundreds of questions to everybody's mind about what is that all about? And I can tell you definitively the place you're going to find that answer is in heaven. <laughs> Nobody really knows. Now, a couple of the best arguments, speculation, is that Satan wanted to take Moses' body so that he could use it as some form of relic to cause people to venerate, worship, deify, idolize Moses. Go to the, go to the um, tomb or the, uh, the grave of Moses, and that would be a holy pilgrimage site. And, and all these things to take away from God from Jesus, from the Word, from the work of Moses, and everything that Moses stood for, Satan wanted to get Moses to do that. Um, it could be that Moses wanted to control, or I mean, the devil wanted to control Moses. Maybe haul him off to hell. We do see that Moses did enter the Promised Land, eventually. But he didn't do it on foot. Yet, we read in the Gospels on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus was there conferring with 
Elijah, and Moses when Peter, James, and John were able to watch that discussion. Jesus is discussing his exodus, the Greek word for departure. I'm about to die. I'm going to heaven. And they were talking about that. And Peter, James, and John got a front row seat of that discussion. And so Moses was there. And then in Revelation 12, there are two witnesses, which we don't know the names of. And yet we look at the things that they do, the powers that they have, the curses they were able to put upon the persons that were trying to kill them as a witness for Jesus in the book of Revelation. And they did things like turn the sea to blood. A lot of things that Moses did or Elijah did. And a lot of people speculate that those two witnesses might be them. For one, they were there at the Mount of Transfiguration. Maybe they're hanging out. You know, they got a road show. They go do this stuff for people. Um, and Elijah being a, a, a witness to the prophets and Moses being a witness to the law, they were able to give uh, those testimonies. We don't know that, but we do know this, that when we get to heaven, we're going to see Moses. Time to finish. Now Joshua, Yeshua, Yahweh saves. His name was originally Hoshea. Moses changed his name to Joshua, which is now the name we use, Jesus, if you go from the Hebrew to the Greek to the English. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. But since there had... Uh, so... And we're going to read that in more detail as we get on into Moses. But we already read that Moses said, I'm going to, I'm going to leave you Joshua. He laid hands on him. That's significant. It's not that there's mojo in it. Not that there's electric power that goes from one to another. It's not that there's not. Did you understand what I just said? When you lay hands on people, I'm not saying that there's power. I'm not saying there's not power. But what it is, is no different when you lay your hands on that lamb brought to the altar to die in your place. You put your hand on that lamb. And when that neck is slit, and as that lamb is bleeding, if it can, with vocal cords or a larynx, severed, I'm get graphic, and blood is pouring out, and the life is ebbing from the body of that lamb, you realize the cost of your sin. And there's a transference from what that animal is going through to you. I'm not saying it's electricity or something like that, but the laying on of hands is a way, a way of imparting a blessing to others. And Moses did this for Joshua. The people saw it, they recognized it, they, re they received it. It says, verse 10, But since then there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, literally mouth to mouth. Not that he looked at him and watched him and talked to him all the time, but he was in constant communication with God. And God spoke to him and through him in the offices of a prophet, of a priest, of a, a, a ruler, a king, and of a judge. And of all the offices of Israel, Moses filled them all. And until Jesus, there was none like him. In the book of Hebrews, in chapter 3, we read in verse 1, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who builds all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of all these things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence 
and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Now, it's been put forward and very possibly the most well-recognized, venerated, and revered person to have ever walked the earth is Moses. More than Jesus. I don't say that to be insulting. But the Jews honor Moses. They don't honor Jesus. The Muslims honor Moses. They don't honor Jesus. And Christians, we honor Moses and Jesus. One of the most well-known figures in all of humanity. Kind of wrapping up here, <clears throat> again in Hebrews, a little a Holy Spirit obituary. Verse 23 of Hebrews 11, the Hall of Faith. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin and esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to the reward. That's some amazing insight. He was looking for Jesus. Let's see. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And I'm going to jump to Exodus chapter 3, and I'm going to come back to Hebrews 11. Because it's a little break between verse 27 and 28 in Hebrews 11. Kind of fills in a little piece in the desert. Exodus 3, 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up from the land to do good and locked to a good and large land, flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hittites, and Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you, this is speaking to Moses, to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And it goes on with the conversation but I'm going to come back to verse 28 of Hebrews 11. By faith, he, Moses, kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who had destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Verse 29, by faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. Verse 10 of Deuteronomy 34, But since then there is not arisen an Israel prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, and all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, before Pharaoh, before all his servants, and all his land, and by all that mighty power, all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. And I know we're probably over time, so I'm going to spend just one more minute reading the last passage of Moses that I have in my Bible. I had told you that was the end of everything that Moses wrote, but it wasn't accurate. Because there's a psalm, Psalm 90, written by Moses. I think it'd be a nice way to finish our study of the Pentateuch, the books of Moses. Psalm 90, verse 1, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past. 
and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning, they are like grass which grows up. In the morning, it flourishes and grows up. In the evening, it is cut down and withered. For we have been consumed by your anger. And by your wrath, we are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And have compassion on your servants. O satisfy us early with your mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us, in the years which we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Amen? Amen. Amen.